Oda, thank you very much. Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to be here, taking with you the journey in uh, the children's world. And Hoda, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, you know, in the past uh, five years, you always see uh, Syria uh, conflicts and civil wars in TV. And uh, I decided, as a researcher of Syria, to, to give you a different angle and a different perspective on the Syrian society and going back with you through time to the Renaissance period, the Arabic Renaissance period, and to show you how attitude uh, to our children was changed and how uh, the women especially, as I will uh, present, uh, saw uh, children in the nursery rooms. So, Western research on children, which has focused mainly on psychological and educational perspectives, is now more centered on viewing childhood as a social, cultural, and historical construct. As of the 1980s, research on children was considered a branch of social and cultural history. From the 1990s, there has been a growing realization that cultures differ in their approaches to children and childhood. Middle Eastern research on children and childhood is still scarce. Until recently, most study concentrate on two time periods, the classic era and the Middle Ages. These works have pointed out that Islamic law and the Hadith, for example, refer to the need to instill children with self-respect. These works, however, do not cover the period of the Arab Renaissance in Arabic, the Nahada, that took place primarily in Greater Syria and Egypt during the 19th century, in which the encounter with Western culture and modernization, together with local development, led to a growing awareness of children and their importance in society. Works which do refer to children during this period concentrate mainly on Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and the Ottoman Empire, but tend to discuss children and childhood in relationship to other topics, such as gender, family, the household, law, education, the nation, modernity, and recently, even charity, philanthropy, and orphanhood. In the last 20 years, a number of studies have dealt with children as an independent category and have tried to explore and understand the world even though it is sometimes filtered through other voices. However, it is still difficult to locate material and sources on the world of children in general and Arab children in particular, since children themselves do not leave evidence behind. In this lecture, I present some preliminary conclusion for my research on children. I suggest that Arabic lullabies, in Arabic tahalil, tahamim, and nursery rhymes are an imperative prism and source of, for analyzing key attitudes toward children and childhood in a specific period. Also, they are not unique to the period of the Nahada, Arabic Renaissance, it is only during this period that some of this oral folklore was put into writing. Research on Western lullabies, both pure to and after the 19th century, emphasized a number of key characteristics in children's lullabies. This include a direct approach to the child, the purpose of the lullaby, the theme of the absent father, the suffering of the mother, the baby's bright future, and unnatural forces. In the Middle East, however, little work has been done on Arabic children's poetry in general, and lullabies in particular. Arabic songs for children and the text of lullabies in Arabic are hard to locate, in particular before the 19th century, though there is extensive research on lullabies among Iraqi Jews during this period. These lullabies 
are pertinent to Arabic lullabies since the Jews of Iraq shared most aspects of Arabic culture with their Iraqi neighbors. For example, Arabic music and literature, and of course, the Arabic language. In fact, some collection of Iraqi Jews lullabies includes song in Arabic from the 19th century. These lullabies are usually said and describe the suffering, again, of the mother and her difficulties in her husband's family. They describe the mother's dream for a better future for her baby and her wish to protect him or her from dangers. My lecture today discusses Arabic lullabies in Greater Syria during the 19th century and attempts to identify their characteristics and main themes. Most of the songs analyzed here are not in the original language, but rather translated to English by the original author, although a few songs remain in Arabic. I argue that lullabies and nursery rhymes can shed additional lights on the emotional world of children and mother, and that they reveal what Walter Andrews called traces of the emotional lives of past people by examining and interpreting the many and varied artifacts, their cultures, and their actions. Recent studies have highlighted the discourse beneath the sphere of ideas and ideologies in attempts to map deeper levels of feeling, relationship, and sensibilities that reveal subculture and emotional voices. Lullabies and nursery rhymes can be considered to create emotional engagement through their loving and emotional tone and constitute an emotional act between mother and child. As noted by Perno Rayfield, emotions are not anthropological constants, but are partly historical and contextual. I aim to illustrate how lullabies and nursery rhymes express the attitude or standards that a society or definable groups within society, in our case women, maintain toward basic emotions and their appropriate expression. This is different from examining emotion per se, which are the individual experiences of emotion conveyed through lullabies <clears throat> and nursery rhymes. Specifically, I argue that lullabies and nursery rhymes, but also dirges and morning songs, are socio-cultural and emotional repositories that can shed light on attitude toward children and childhood. They reveal not only the private world of mothers and children, and thus the world that children live in, but also the way women maintained their discourse and attitude toward children, were able to present an alternative to the hegemonic discourse of men. As Morrison noted, the experiences of children were sometimes closely linked to the experiences of women, but were nonetheless different. The database for this lecture is made up of more than 100 translated lullabies and nursery rhymes and several songs in Arabic that were collected and translated by the American missionary Henry Harris Jessop during the 19th century in the region of Greater Syria. Also, I'd like to take a minute to point out the region's socioeconomic background. From the first half of the 19th century, as a result of the immense export and import activities between the region of Greater Syria and Europe, the city of Beirut and also Mount Lebanon, become the economic and cultural center of greater Syria. Beirut and its growing foreign trade attracted an increasing number of merchants and entrepreneurs from the periphery. It was during this period that local middle class arose in the city. Some of its members were originally from Mount Lebanon. The need for trade with ties with foreigners necessitated an expansion of the traditional education system and missionary, especially American Protestants who came to the region from 1820, began to set up a network of school in Beirut and Mount Lebanon. Members of this Arab middle class gradually adopted Western ideas style but strove 
also to preserve their own traditional Arab culture. Furthermore, attitudes toward children and childhood changed considerably during the 19th century in the region of Greater Syria. In Arab societies, the child has always been seen as the crucial generational link in the family unit and the key to its continuation. However, during the 19th century, there was a sharp rise in patriotism among the Syrian Arab middle class in the region with a drive to create a modern Arab society in response to the encounter with Western culture. The place of women, and by extension, children, was redefined in the sense that now children were considered to determine not only their family's future, but also that of society and the Syrian Arab nation. Intellectual of that time tended to see the family and not the individual as the basic socio-political unit and viewed marriage, the marital relationship, and children's education as the vital building block of modern Arab civilized society. This family-centered attitude was partly influenced by the discourse on domesticity taking place at that time in Europe and America. It was also the result of the influence of the American missionary education. Before long, lively public dialogue on child rearing and concepts of childhood, such as the place of the child in society and parents' obligation to their children, was kindled in the Syrian Arab Lebanese middle class. And local newspapers devoted extensive coverage to the significance of the nuclear family and domesticity. In general, writers of the Nahada believed that men's duties lay outside the house, while women's obligations were inside the home. Intellectuals argued women should be educated to fulfill what they considered to be the most important mission, raising their children, the future generation in society. The press in particular, but not exclusively, was an especially eager promoter of instructing women in home management. Magazines and journals in Egypt, Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria all published articles calling for female education in home economics and emphasized the prestige of motherhood. Wives and mothers were also encouraged to become active agents in influencing their husbands and their children's behavior. This perception partly changed the more traditional role of the mother, especially among the middle class. However, in rural eras, women preserved their Arab traditional role in which mothering was mainly a temporary activity for the good of the child, but also for the benefit of the patrilineal family. It was defined as maternal warmth and careful attention to the welfare of the child. Women, for example, taught their daughter swing and cooking, told stories, sent nursery rain, but, but dealt less with their education, or for that matter, their son's education. Also, the debate concerning child rearing in ch and children education in Arab society was by this time centuries old, new educational theories, incorporating both the work of European enlightenment like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Sinkers, a 19th century physician, was added to the mix. Newspaper featured articles calling for tolerance to our children and ways to make children happy, healthy, and obedient. Thus, alongside the interest in children's education, there was a growing awareness of the place of children in society and their needs. Because education had become so important for both parents, the main issue revolved around the meaning of education and how to educate children. Male Arab writers in the Syrian press primarily argued that children needed to undergo a process of education which would transform them into better individuals or citizens with proper virtue and morality. The goal of child rearing was to instill and develop children's ability to reason as well as to discipline which was seen as a prime factor for successful adult life in society. 
The authors made it clear that not every woman was capable of accomplishing this goal since the educator needs to possess the same good qualities. She herself needs to be properly educated. Mothers must stop telling, and this is important, fairy tales and rely on superstitions, which were very common in Arab societies, and concentrate their teaching on principles of culture. Another central issue in the 19th century was girls' education from a young age, which was considered no less important than boys' education, and it, this was a true changing. Men, but also women, wrote that girls' education was vital not only for educating a woman to take care of her husband and children, but also for the construction of her femininity starting in childhood. All the writers of the Nada emphasized the importance of both parents in educating their children, both boys and girls, but patriarchy was still preserved and does authority. Guidance and discipline continue to be viewed as the father's province. Also at the turn of the 19th century, children clearly began to capture a larger place in their adult imagination in the writing of the Arab middle class in Greater Syria, yet children themselves were often brought up under an inflexible domestic regime. Nevertheless, this change in attitude did not occur to the same extent in the lower middle and lower classes in town and the peripheral regions of Greater Syria. However, as we shall see, some of these notions seem to have percolated and were partly reflected in lullabies in the villages of Mount Lebanon. All the women were gradually part of this discourse, men were still the leading hegemonic voice in the public sphere. Nevertheless, women, both from the middle but also from the lower classes, found additional ways to reveal the voices such as through folklore, one of which was through lullabies and nursery rhymes. This is what I think. Um, just like in other cultures, some of these rhymes have been lost over time. Others have been passed down through the generation. Generally, lullabies are emotional and are sent to children from birth. They vary in style and tonality, depending on geographic era, but the purpose is always the same, to develop an attachment between human beings who are making and listening to the music. The concept of singing to a child to come and comfort through continuous repetition of pleasant rhythms goes beyond the functional transition from activity to slumber. It provides the child with a sense of safety and security while falling asleep. Lullabies like nursery rhymes are traditionally considered to reflect mother's wishes, pains and sorrows, language learning, as well as the socialization of the child and the teaching of values. Through lullabies, the infant is introduced to language, poetry, and music, but this also represents one of the infant's first forms of verbal exchange with caretaking adults and contact with the social milieu. Lullabies and nursery rhyme, including in Arab culture, are product of oral, tra oral tradition and can be defined as a subgenre of oral literature and folklore. Though these songs probably dominated the world of Arab children, they were rarely preserved in writing. However, the writing and the archives of the American missionaries who were active in the region of Great Assyria can shed some light on this topic. Missionaries' writing are a valuable source to explore the political, social, and cultural history of the region. Even though missionary activity spans the spectrum from altruism to cultural colonialism, it provides a glimpse, albeit biased, into children's life through characterization of the local population, which were mainly used to serve their ultimate goal of evangelization. Hence, the voice of mothers and children were filtered through missionary tales and colonial sources. It is well known that the American missionary 
Henry Harris Jessup, wrote extensively on Arab women. But it is less well known that he also recorded and described local children daily life. Jessup graduated from the Yale in 1851 and from the Union Theological Seminary in 1855, at which point he was officially ordained. He immediately entered the foreign missionary service of the Presbyterian Church. He spent his first four years of service in Tripoli, Lebanon, devoting much time to learning Arabic, which he proved extremely adept. He served as a missionary in Syria for nearly 53 years. During his work, he documented material related to children, such as games, children's plays, songs, which are evidence of Arab children's leisure time, stories for children, textbooks, and also more than 100 nursery rhymes and lullabies. Jessup's documentation of Syrian lullabies and nursery rhymes is thus an important source for the study of Arab children's cultural life. It provides an opportunity to explore the emotional, intimate relationship between families and their children, and to depict the subculture and sub-voices of caretakers, primarily mother, but also sister and grandmothers. It also sheds light on adults' emotional and moral investment in children, and the neglected role of women educators in the private sphere in early childhood. Jessup's translation of these local lullabies are unique. Nevertheless, and this is important, the words, rhythm, rhymes, and local meaning of the authentic source language are lost. However, since Jessup spoke Arabic fluently, the translation can be assumed to be accurate. Although the lexical and semantic structure of the originally may not emerge in the English. There are indications that Jessup was aware of these problems and made an effort to be faithful to the original Arabic text. Jessup collected and translated local Arab lullabies and nursery rhymes in three of his books, The Women of the Arab, written in 1872, Syrian Home Life, written in 1874, and in Kitab al-Raud al-Nadir, Libahajat Kul Walat Sarir, translated as the kindergarten rare book for the delight of any young child. This is the book I, after a long time, I found at Harvard University, which have the only copy, and it's a remarkable, a fascinating book with a lot of picture, and of course, uh, Arabic writing. The latter was the only book in which he published number of lullabies and Ersirem in the original Arabic. The first book, The Women of the Arab, contains a long chapter, 136 pages on children, which is a treasure trove of rare material on children in the region, of, uh, in the region such as game, riddle, lullabies for both girls and boys, morning song, nursery rhyme, dirges, or wedding song, song against evil eye, children's song, and story for children. As part of Jessup's ethnographic work in the region, he traveled from place to place and from one home to another, listening and talking with women, men, and children. His writing in this regard is a mixture of his interest in the region and its people and his patronizing didactic voice. We can't ignore it. He collected songs from Mount Lebanon in places such as Abay, Chasbaya, and from cities such as Tripoli, Sidon, and Iker. The songs are representative of the different sects of the region, Druze, Muslim, Christians, and Bedouin. Most of these songs appear to have been sang in agrarian eras of Greater Syria, and especially among people of the lower middle class in the small towns and cities of the region which were in close contact with Beirut. We, we couldn't find this song if, if, if it wasn't for he. In the next few minutes, I would like to elaborate on some themes and characteristics of these lullabies. The lullabies and nursery rhyme just of translated are a hybrid mixture of the universal characteristics. They include some traditional motif for much older traditional Arab songs, but Adam makes explicit references to, this, to a specific time 
and region which in fact mirror Arab Syrian society of the 19th century. Um, in other words, they have certain features that seem to be different from other Arab lullabies. The universal characteristic of these Arab lullabies are related to themes such as mother loves, her fear and wishes for the child's prosperous future, and peaceful sleep. Jessup himself noted that a Druze nursery rain remind him of two English rains, who killed Cock Robin, and the house that Jack built. Most of the nursery rhymes and lullabies have repeatable lines with a rhythm and abound with animal subjects and motifs, each region with its own familiar animals. The songs that Jessop collected also reflect continuity in terms of the traditional topics in Arab lullabies attuned to a specific local Arab culture. Again, Many of the subjects refer to the world of animals, mainly ducks, donkeys, horses, and deer that were typical to the region. The tunes are simple melodies and can be either plaintive or juvenile, with a catchy tune and rhythm. Many of the lullabies aim to teach right from wrong. The anthropologist Farha Ranam noted in her chapter on Kuwaiti 20th century song that Arab lullabies are considered a very basic part of the child's socialization process. They are designed to teach children societal norms, values, and tradition. A typical example is, spin a third and let us play. Eat your supper, come away. He who will not leave his book, hang his father on a hook. Another core topic is traditional Arab lullaby is the belief in superstitions, such as the evil eye, which is found in several Jessup collected songs and reflected the belief that some words have magical power to harm their children. Over the century, certain Arab lullabies turned into magical poetic musical creation, which are considered to be powerful means of defense against the evil eye and evil demons. In Arabic, rul or jinn, genie, as you probably know, which were an important part of the traditional local culture. This is, explains why many of the songs in Jessup collection curse female and male evil doers who can injure or place a spell on their child. Sometimes the song refers to the evil eye of members of the family, for instance, if she love you not, my boy, may the Lord her life destroy. Seven mules tread her down, drag her body through the town. Snakes that from the ceiling hang, sting her dead with poison fang. Soldier from Damascus city, drag her off and show no pity, nor release her for a day, though a thousand pounds to pay. Or I have circled your round with Allah, from my eye and the eye of your brother, from the eye of your father and mother, from all who admire and respect you, may the eye of Allah protect you, or upon you the name of Allah, around you Allah's eyes, may the evil eye be blinded and never harm my boy. The mother is a prime protector from the evil eye. For example, O oh my uncle, my cameleer, Take me back to my mother, dear. I fear the rule, the demon, will catch and eat me, but mother, dear, will surely meet me. This belief in superstition, especially on part of women, was strong, so strong that one of the leading intellectuals of the Nahada, Ahmad Fares El Shidiak, the editor and publisher of the newspaper El Jawaib in Istanbul, took a public stand against this tradition. Although he criticized Western society, he was fascinated by its attitude to her children. He argued that the difference between the roles of European and Arab women was that European women educate and teach their children before they start school, whereas Eastern women fill their children's heads with tales and superstitions. Hence, Eastern children are weak and crowdly compared to European children who are proud, active, full of initiative and contribute to society. In defense of women, 
Maria Macarius, an educated woman, wrote in an article in 1880 that as of ancient times, superstition were part of women's culture both in the West and in the East. She presents several examples of superstition from England, Ireland, and Denmark, and showed that Europeans believe in the evil eyes as well. Shidiak's criticism resembled the hegemonic, rational, didactic male discourse delivered through the press and in lectures. Men criticized not only superstition, but also fairy tales, and instead encouraged stories with moral and educational messages. Nevertheless, by singing these kinds of lullabies, women could introduce an additional voice that emphasized emotion, such as tenderness mixed with fears or happiness, and not only rationality. Children's lullaby provided a space where affection between adults and children could be openly addressed. Although these nursery rhymes were simple, they may have con uh, contrasted with the authorian dictates on behavior they heard from male members of the family. Jessup collection also deal with several more modern topics that shed light on the way local lullabies reflect a changing attitude toward children during the 19th century. One uh, was the growing concern for girls. Since the time of the Jahiliya, before Islam, a baby boy was preferred over a baby girl and most songs were for boys. Jessup noted the growing interest in girls and that in urban eras, girls were being given more attention uh, than in the countryside, which in his mind was linked to mission, of course, to missionary work. Nevertheless, these changes in local alibis for girls took place gradually both in the larger cities of greater Syria and in smaller towns and in Mount Lebanon, since they were part of the same socioeconomic network of the region. They were not only part of the missionary educational system, but mirrored the 1869 Ottoman public education law, as well as affected all of greater Syria and Mount Lebanon. This law is considered an important turning point for education in Ottoman Empire. Education had previously been limited to waqf, or religious schools and private endowments and initiatives that focus on religious education, which was mainly for boys. In contrast, the Ottoman public education law mandated the founding of a comprehensive and secular public school system throughout the Ottoman Empire. Primary education was made obligatory for all children. University were set up. The curriculum focused on secular subject deemed necessary to achieve the much sought after modernity, and school opened in previously excluded village and towns. For the first time, the law officially recognized the necessity of opening girls' schools and providing female teachers. All these changes help transform attitude toward girls. Nevertheless, as in the past, many songs still praise baby boys. Here is one example of a Muslim a lullaby. O Lord of heavens, knowing and wise, preserve my Ali, the light of my eyes. Lord of high heaven, compassion, keep my dear bo boy in every state. Other expression of disappointment at a birth of a baby girl, which was highly acceptable in the past, were not part of Jessop's collection. Out of more than 100 songs, Fewer than 10 were for girls. In most cases, the main themes for boys were connected to horses, courage, but also love and affection, whereas lullabies for baby girls also describe affection and love for them. They are presented as important to their father, which is very extraordinary, even serve as a source of his happiness and pride. Their beauty and virtues are described, as well as their mother's loving care. A lullaby about a baby girl called Lulu, a name often chosen for its easy raiming, is as follows. Lulu, dear, the house is bright. With your foreheads, sunny light, men your father honor now when they see your lovely brow. If father comes home sad and worried, sight of you will make him cheery. 
very unusual. The endless love for girls is also obvious in burial songs. Oh girls, have you seen a fair maiden with perfume and choice henna laden, or robed in her garments so fair, and with lilies entwined in her hair? We saw her and called, but no answer she gave. We called, we called her again, all was still as a grave. Another key feature of this lullaby is a nursery rhyme, which symbolized the change in attitude to her children in this period, was the growing centrality of the child in the imagination of the adult. And I must say, even in the Western songs, we can see it. This contrast, for example, with Iraqi Arab lullabies from Mesopotamia, and also lullabies in the Iraqi Jews community during the 19th and 20th century, in which the poetic subject, the wife and the mother, mediates on her own life and suffering. She sings mainly about herself and not all about her child. This, as I was said, was also in the Western songs. In Jesup collections, there are only few lullabies which reveal the patriarchal condition or the problems of women or reflect their suffering. However, many songs are centered on the children. For example, I love you, my boy, and this is the proof. I wish that you had all the west of the shoof, hundreds of costly silken bells, hundreds of sheep with lofty sails, hundreds of towns to obey your word, and thousands to call you Lord. Oh, I will sing to you, God will bring to you all you need, my dear. He is here and there, he is everywhere, and to you, he is ever here. Some of the nursery rhymes and lullabies also emphasize each, each child's uniqueness and the understanding that each child is different. For example, one like you was never born. One like you was never brought. All the Arab might grow old, yet with all the battles fought, one like you never caught. The theme of the uniqueness of each child is obvious in morning song for boys. For example, good morning now to you, little boy. Your face is like the dew, little boy. There never was a child so merry and so mild. So good morning once again, little boy. Other lullabies describe mother fears, including kidnapping by Bedouins or gypsies. Jessup notes that there were many cases in the region where children were kidnapped and their parents were at time unable to save them. He mentions lullaby sent by Maronite women in Mount Lebanon that tells the story of, a dot, of a dot, the daughter of a prince who was kidnapped by Bedouins. She is raised in their camp and is married to one of the sheikhs and she gives birth to a baby boy. One day when a feast is held and grape seller arrive, she recognizes them as people from her village. She sings a song in which she tells her story, hoping that one of the merchants will recognize her. And the song, of course, is a lullaby. Some lullabies refer to a typical disease or infections that probably were the result of poor hygiene. One of the main problems in the region was fleas. The local population usually shook fleas into the fire, it's a true story, especially in the, into the oven when sitting around in the evening. It, in the evening. Jessop translated a Druze nursery reign about a brilliant bug and a noble flea who went to the oven to shake off other horrible fleas from their garments into the fire. But alas, the noble flea lost his footing fell into the fire and was consumed. <laughs> to conclude, lullabies, the treasure of the world's oral and folklore literature for children, contain endless amounts of valuable cultural material. This lecture aims to show that Arab lullabies and nursery rhymes are socio-cultural and emotional repository whose content and meaning should be taken into account as they can reveal the attitudes and the emotion of a specific period to a children and childhood. In a way, 
Syrian Arab lullabies preserve the local traditional culture of women. The richness of the popular folk culture of children in lullaby is an oral source that is gradually being lost. Further research should document these songs and their changing themes in various periods and geographic regions. By comparing, for example, the Nahada's lullabies and nursery rhymes with lullabies and nursery rhymes from other regions and period, the changing in attitude to a children and the emotional condition of a specific period can be better understood. Because Elek noted that emotion are both indicators and factors of historical changes. They both reflect historical transformations and bring them about. Lullabies reveal the nature and regulation of the private world. They created and preserved as in the past and probably before the 19th century, an enjoyable and emotional discourse by women that introduces an additional voice to the hegemonic discourse of male educators. Whereas the modern period was witness to a change in attitude toward children partly under the influence of Western discourse, Arab lullabies help preserve traditional and local Arab culture artifacts that might have been lost through time or modernization. By singing lullabies and nursery rhymes, women become educators in the private sphere by engaging the young in a dialogic and imaginative construction of their social possibilities. Hence, research on lullabies shed light on the relationship between caregivers and children, and children but um, also documents facets of children's cultural words. It helps describe the first environment children are exposed to, the fears of their parents, but most of all, how they lived. Uh, saying this, I want to show you some picture uh, some example from the kindergarten's rare book for the delight of any young children. Uh, and I will show you some example in Arabic, how he, it was coming like this. He wrote in Arabic the song so we can know what uh, word was used and made uh, further research. But what was, I, I was astonished was the picture in the books that the children read or sang, and which was written in Arabic, look at the pictures. This is a picture. She is not an Arabic uh, child, right? For sure. But this, and I thought maybe some, some of you in the audience recognize the picture. I, I'm sure that they are taken from English or American books. But look, you, you can imagine yourself in this class, in a rural uh, countryside, uh, little girls see for the first time picture of girls and think about it and read what is written there and it's so unique and it's, it was not used in, in the region. So this is about a, a child who, who was asked to uh, sit quietly, manners, virtues. Another uh, song which I could find is from Sidon, which I think we don't have any songs from them. And of course, I, uh, there was a lot of uh, mistake in the song for the children to make them laugh and so on. And look at this. This is uh, from children's book, you see. Uh, for surely from um, Western uh, sources. And this is to uh, teach girls that they have to gather her toys. You see, she forgot the, this one and it was broken. So an educated uh, a text also for the children. And they are unique picture. We don't have a, a lot of picture like this in the Arab uh, region. And this is another. And this one was also very nice. You see how to wash yourself and so on. And I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you very much. We will now have some questions from the audience. <laughs> was the book uh, printed in the, in the 19th century 
Yeah. Yeah, they had a press in uh, uh, Syria from the 1824, which the missionary brought, and they were uh, publishing all the material there. Most of the material was religious sources, but uh, this was um, part of the educational uh, system, so they uh, publish a lot of uh, children's books, and uh, coming uh, from uh, Harvard to here, I found uh, some examples, unique example of uh, mathematics uh, books, uh, manual books, which are uh, the library is going to photocopy for me. So it's very important, very excited to find all this material. From the 1840, we, you, we can find some material. Other questions? You said they were morning songs. Um, yeah. It could be that these other songs are for older girls, but many cultures have songs for young girls, or they're not necessarily always young girls, for young women or young girls leaving the house when they are brides. And these are a combination of morning songs and farewell right. songs. Were these ever? Yeah, there were, uh, there were several songs like this. But uh, I, I chose the lullaby, so I didn't. Okay. But it was the same. I think most of the themes are similar to what they are singing today. I okay. have a question. Oh. So the pictures you showed, the, the actual pictures, drawings, those are from Western? Uh, yeah, I have some signature of uh, Western uh, drawers and so on. That were but just, I have to find uh, But they some were adapted and put into yeah, these Arabic sources. Yeah, he took the the illustration and put an Arabic text mm -hmm. beside it because you don't have any picture of children and a picture at all in the Arab society. So it, uh, they are the first one. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm curious about the structure of your talk and curious about, and this is a, really a theoretical question more than it is anything else, but I want to hear you talk about it. Okay. <laughs> is that you go from the outside in. In other words, there are a series of things that are occurring uh, at that period of time. And whatever it is, is being refracted through what the missionaries wrote, what the missionary wrote, and then somehow connect at the next level to mothers and children, or fathers or children, and the family unit becomes something else. At the bottom of that, you know, of that structure, yeah. lay the lullabies, the children and the mothers in interaction with each other. Yeah. When you planned the talk, did you know that you are going to attend to the context first and the children last and is there a way to do it the other way around? No, I, I was telling in the break that the um, subject chose me. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> choose the subject. To tell you the truth, it's one of the articles I didn't plan uh, from the beginning. It was so, I didn't have nothing and I said no, I'm going to write about it and I start checking, and then I remember that I read a book 15 years ago which have a chapter on children, and nobody paid attention to it. Everybody said to me, uh, like I was uh, dealing with uh, novels, and everybody said, nah, they are not so important, and this was the same. And then I decided it was during the night, I'm going to read it. And after reading it, I said, wow, there is so many things. And I literally picked, you know, pieces and it took me a long time and maybe and I'm always changing the article because I don't know what I'm going to see with <laughs> what I photocopy now but it was I decided first to give an analyzation of what happening in regard to uh, research on, on children because uh, to know where to put myself and then when I look at the research in the Middle East I saw that it's it's scarce because they don't talk about children. They talk about everything, and through the, this, they will talk about children. 
And I was doing it also because we don't have anything. But I could give a different angle of the issue. And the angle I wanted to know is what happened with the woman in the village that we, do, we don't hear her, we don't have her, we don't know what she feel. And what was amazed that I read all this um, uh, theoretical uh, um, information about the Western uh, lullabies, and always they talk about the suffering of the mother. And when I looked at Jessop, I saw that it's not exist. They talk about the children, how they love them. So I said, wow, it's, it's very unique to see two cultures, and you, sometimes you are biased toward this culture, and you see that it was very, I think, very um, advanced in how they saw their children, even though it wasn't a perfect society. So it was like taking the whole analysis of on children, and you know, the, what I'm trying to uh, show is that there are still uh, material waiting for us to explore and to delve from them new informations. This is my main uh, purpose. There's one more over here. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I'm very interested in the way that um, mythology and mysticism told to children how it helps them to broaden their view or learn to think outside of the lines to play in the imaginary. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about that and how that might be used in the Syrian culture? As I said in my lecture, I feel that this is a real artifact of a lost culture. Because in this, in the room, when nobody uh, look and listen, you can do whatever you want. And when, you don't agree with me, <laughs> but you know, they, they sang to the children. I imagine that the husband were occupying doing other things. And they like gave them, it gave them some um, uh, fr fr freeness, you know. They could talk and they, um, I will tell you what. This research came after a book I wrote with Sharon about the intellectual history of the region. And everything was to be modernized, to be civilized, to be advanced. And it was the main voice of society at that time. But these lullabies are captured the, the, the daily life, uh, the dreams, uh, the happiness, the fears that uh, I think uh, women felt at this time, but more than that, the superstition was very important. W people really believed in superstition. So this was the, the focus of their life. And at the, at the same time, someone said to him, this is barbaric, this is not good. This is not an, uh, it's not a civilized society. You have to take this out. And they continue in doing it through the songs. And a lot of songs are talking about um, all these superstitions. And, and I felt that this mother needed, they, they were needed to, to, to sing it because they were afraid that if they will not do it, uh, something happened to their child. So they didn't uh, take interest uh, in uh, to become all, all educated women. They wanted to protect their children, and they thought that these lullabies and their culture can help them with this. So I hope I, I, I have so many questions myself and unresolved uh, problems. I will need to delve more and more into it. <laughs>